Mario has been a staple in the video game industry ever since he was first introduced to the world in 1985. Dozens of Super Mario Bros games has been made ever since, but which one stands truly on top? Hello, Felix from Nintendo Life here, and today we'll be ranking the 14 best Super Mario Bros games. This list will consist of only mainline Mario games, so no Mario Party, Mario Kart and Mario Hoops 3 on 3. And don't solely blame me for this list, as it was actually a collaborative effort by the whole Nintendo Life staff. But without further ado, let's dive right into things. Wait, that's not my catchphrase. At number 14 we have New Super Mario Bros for the Nintendo DS. This game was released back in 2006 and was the first time since 1992's Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins that we had a classic 2D Mario game. New Super Mario Bros revived the 2D gameplay and it was the first time Mario was introduced in 2.5D. Essentially, it's 3D models, but it plays out like a 2D side-scroller. Even though this game was going off older ideas from the 80s and 90s, it still manages to bring a lot of new stuff to the table. Ideas like the Star Coins, which has been a staple in the Mario Bros games ever since, new power-ups like the Mega Mushroom, and original and unique bosses for each of the big castles. Although the same cannot be said for the mini castles, as you just fight Bowser Jr. The original game's composer Koji Kondo is also back with some stellar tunes that everyone my age can sing and dance along to, and that goes the same for the enemies. I loved this game growing up, and just because it's at 14th place doesn't mean it's a bad game, quite the contrary actually. There's just so many good Mario games that even the ones on last place in this list could still be considered masterpieces. While we might be tired of the new Super Mario Bros games now, at the time it was a really nice callback to some good old classics while still having some new, fresh, inventive ideas. Hmm, that new is really throwing me off. Let me see if I can... <sighs> That's better. And at number 13 we have the game that started it all, Super Mario Bros for the NES. For a game that saved the gaming industry, it's really impressive that the whole package was less than 31 kilobytes. That's less than this picture shown right here. The 8 worlds, mushroom power-ups, Goombas, Lucky 2, Cheap Cheeps and Bullet Bills. It's so incredible how fun and creative this whole game was. The first level was a tutorial. It didn't tell you what to do, but it laid out the stuff so you would instinctively jump over the Goomba, get the mushroom power-up and so on. It it was a launch title for Nintendo's first home console, and boy did it break records. To this day, Super Mario Bros for the NES has sold 58 million copies. That's more than the population of England and Wales combined. This game reinvented the gaming industry as we know it today, and set a standard for how Mario Bros games and platformers are as a whole to this day today, and for that, it must be respected. Yeah. Yeah. Man, 3D in the real world is amazing! <sighs> Boy, do I have a game for you! This game follows the narrative like any other. Bowser has kidnapped Princess Peach and now Mario has to go and save the day. Only that this time it's not in 2D, but in 3D. Because of the stereoscopic 3D, the developers could use a lot of unique angles and depth that wouldn't have worked in a non-3D Mario game. It's hard to describe if you haven't tried the 3DS, but angles like this and this doesn't look quite good, does it? But as soon as you slide that 3D slider, it just works. This was also the first Mario game on the 3DS and it was filled to the brim with content. Not only do you have the usual 8 worlds, you also have 8 bonus worlds on top of that. It's like they packed a whole sequel into this game. It's a 2D game, but in 3D. You have the usual power-ups, a timer, and a flagpole, but in the moveset it actually lends some stuff from the sandbox Mario games like the backflip and long jump. It may be in 3D World's shadow today, but this game is just fantastic. Excellent level design, brilliant implementation of the 3D, and the Tanuki suit. Mario 
Nintendo 64 had been a revolution, and after the big success of the game, you would think that they would just go and make the same game again, just with a new coat of paint, but that's not how Nintendo rules. Because Mario Sunshine was willing to take risks and get weird. The game starts with Mario going on a vacation to Delfino Island, but the island is having problems with a Shadow Mario, which looks strikingly similar to our beloved Italian plumber. So much so that they actually arrest Mario and make him do community service, cleaning up all the graffiti Shadow Mario has left behind. And to help him do that, he has this machine called Flood that sprinkles water and it's sentient. You know, standard stuff. When Mario 64 stages were on a snowy top or at a desert, Mario Sunshine stages exclusively take place on this tropical island. You have a theme park, a beach, and the most wonderful hub world, Delfino Plaza. You do have occasional secret stages that either strip Mario off his jetpack or goes away from the vacation theme, but those levels are really few and far between. The music also really encapsulates the summer vacation vibe this game is trying to give, and you just get in such a good mood while listening to it. This game is a wonderful successor to Mario 64, but it falls short in places in comparison to other 3D Mario games, and that is why it's the last one of the bunch on this list. But the setting and world is fantastic, and it worked as a wonderful stepping stone for future 3D Mario games. Mario Brothers, Wee The story is as basic as any Mario Bros game. Peach gets kidnapped again, and you have to go through eight different worlds to save her. Only that this time you don't have to do it alone, and you can invite three other friends to play with you. Alright, I invited some friends over, so now we're gonna play some... I don't have any friends. The playable characters this time was Mario, Luigi, and two random toads. Not like there's two other characters that wouldn't have been perfect for this game. <laughs> this game was and still is the perfect party game. So much screaming and chaos and it was super easy just to pick up and play. You didn't have to explain to your friends what you were doing because everyone knows what you do in a Mario Bros game. We also received some new power-ups like the propeller helmet and the penguin suit, which both are wonderful inclusions which open up for some creative level ideas. If you played New Super Mario Bros. DS, you get a lot of the same. Same worlds, same music, almost, but even though they are similar, Super Mario Bros. Wii, we feel, is just a tad bit more fun, and a lot of the factor is the addition of 4-player co-op. Now, you can only play so many Super Mario Bros. games and levels before it gets stale, so what's the solution here? The answer is quite simple. Super Mario Maker. It's a Super Mario game where you either make levels or play levels others have created. It's a simple idea, but the way it's presented and works... I think a lot of people never imagined Nintendo would create an official Mario Maker game, but my belief is that after they heard so many complaints about their previous new Super Mario games, especially New Super Mario Bros. U, they just thought, well, if you don't like it, then make it yourself. And boy did we. 7.2 million created levels, so you will never run out. Of course, this means a lot of them are horribly bad, but among them are some genuine masterpieces. There were levels with time trials, intricate puzzles, and some that felt unclearable. But the thing was that every stage was in fact clearable, because if you wanted to upload a stage to the public, you had to clear it yourself first. So you decided to make a level. Well, you had one important choice first, because you could make these levels in four different styles. The original Super Mario Bros for the NES, Super Mario Bros 3, Super Mario World, or Super Mario Bros U. Each different game gave very different playthroughs of their levels, because in each of the styles, Mario controls very differently. There were also tons of items and enemies you could add, plus so many costumes you could unlock via Amiibo. So this meant you could run around like Link, Kirby, Inkling, Olimar, and even Sonic the Hedgehog. I don't think any kids in the 90s would have imagined to be able to play as Sonic in a Mario game. And while this game wasn't perfect at launch, with multiple updates down the road, this became an instant classic and inspired so many people to create and play through their own Mario levels. Yeah. Yeah. 
Super Mario 3D World is like a bigger and better version of Super Mario 3D Land. And similar to the situation with New Super Mario Bros DS and Wii, 3D World adds 4 player co-op to the equation. But where New Super Mario Bros Wii is very similar to New Super Mario Bros on the DS, 3D World expands on every idea that 3D Land had. Cool new items? You got it. Fun characters that each have their own playstyle? Check. Bonus stages that eventually became its own game? I think you know where I'm going with this. The new big thing in 3D World is the Cat Bell. It's a power-up that turns you into a cat. You can scale large obstacles, die from the sky, and meow when you finish a stage. Like, what's not to love? It was also the first time we saw Captain Toad as a playable character. In these small puzzle stages where the main gimmick was that Captain Toad couldn't jump because of his heavy backpack, so you had to find a way to get to the star without jumping. And these small stages eventually became its own game called Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. Instead of saving Princess Peach this time, you can now play as her, as she is one of the four playable characters that are Mario, Luigi, Toad, and as I said, Peach. This character lineup is the same as in Mario Bros 2, and they even play similarly too. Peach can float, Toad is very fast, Luigi can jump high, and Mario is… well, <laughs> Mario. <laughs> The story is a bit different this time. Well, Bowser has still kidnapped someone, but this time it's six Sprixy princesses. And there's loads of content in this game just like there was in 3D Land. Six main worlds, two Bowser worlds, and four bonus worlds. A fair bit more than the usual eight worlds, wouldn't you say? But all this content I just talked about isn't the only thing in this game, because when they ported the game from the Wii U to the Switch, they added a whole new experience called Bowser's Fury. Where 3D World is essentially a 3D Super Mario Bros game, Bowser's Fury is much closer to Super Mario Sunshine and Odyssey. I won't spoil any of the single player parts for you, but it's original, fun and just bursting with charm. It's me, Mario! Like the original Super Mario Bros for the NES, which set a standard for 2D Mario games for years to come, Super Mario 64 did the same for 3D Mario games and just 3D games in general. It was the world's first not terrible 3D platformer and boy did it just nail so many things out of the box, so much so that things still look very similar in platformers to this day today. While there had been 3D games before, many see Mario 64 as the true jump from 2D to 3D. It might look dated now, but at the time, there was nothing quite like it. The story is also a bit different this time around. Sure, Peach has been captured again, but instead of reaching a flagpole at the end of each level, you now have to collect stars. Now, how do you collect stars, you ask? Well, isn't it obvious? You jump into a picture. These pictures are located in the truly iconic hub world Peach's Castle, with the equally iconic song to accompaniment it. The castle has many rooms and doors, and you actually use these new stars to open doors that were previously inaccessible, and in these rooms there are these pictures that you can jump into with a level in them. The levels in this game are also truly iconic. bob -on Battlefield, Cool Cool Mountain, just to name a few. In each level there are multiple stars to collect. One might be where you have to collect 8 red coins, another where you have to raise a giant penguin. Stuff like this makes it really fun to jump into levels again because you don't know what you'll find next. Mario 64 was quite frankly the best launch game ever made up until 2017, and that we still control Mario the same way that we did back then just shows how the team behind the game got it right the first time around. Now the camera controls and visuals have maybe not aged like fine wine, and that is why we still have 6 other Mario games to talk about, but all around a truly fantastic game that really can hit you with nostalgia if you played this as a kid. At number 6 we have Super Mario Bros 3. This game took everything that made the original Super Mario Bros game good and made it even better. This game's size was 10 times larger than the original game while still running on the same console. It introduced new power-ups like the Super Leaf, Frog Suit and Hammer Bros Suit, new worlds like Pipe Pipe Park and Not Tiny Huge Island, and new graphics that made the old Super Mario Bros game pale in contrast. 
Super Mario Bros. 3 was one of the most anticipated games when it released in North America in the early 90s. There was a constant shortage of the game. There was even a movie which revolved about the game called The Wizard. And if you were a kid during this age, it was the thing to wish for for Christmas. Mario Bros. 3 introduced the overworld to Mario games. A standard by now, but before it, it was just a linear experience. You know, when you completed one level, you just got booted into the next one, where this time around you could choose your own path, choose what levels you wanted to play, you could go into a mushroom house, get some items, and there were even items that could affect the overworld. Some made the enemies like Hammer Bros sleep, others could help you skip a hard level. And as soon as you booted up Mario Bros. 3, there was a clear theme the enter. From the curtains at the opening, to the bolted into the background platforms. Even when you finished a stage, you literally went off stage. Mario Bros 3 shows how you take something that was already good and make it even better. And it's loved by fans the world over. Yeah. Yeah. Released in 2010, we have Super Mario Galaxy 2. When the game first started production, it was originally thought as, as an expansion or an updated version of Mario Galaxy, but after some thought, they thought it was better just to make it a full-fledged new game. This game was just more Mario Galaxy, nothing truly inventive, but it had some new ideas like adding Yoshi, where when you controlled him, instead of your pointer being a star, it became Yoshi's tongue. So with this, you could point Yoshi's tongue around and launch it at stuff like enemies or items. The hub world was also different. When the first game you had Rosalina's observatory, in this you had a spaceship shaped like Mario's head. The way you could access the levels was also much more linear. Where this time around, it looks a lot like 3D land, where it's like one line. Instead of the original, where you could enter houses to fly to galaxies in a more free order, kinda like Mario 64. The story is also pretty similar to the first one. Ah, 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 I am Bowser, and I'm here to kidnap you! Oh, I know, I've already packed. Yeah, you have to save Peach, and to do so, you must again go through very different galaxies and complete some of the best levels you're ever gonna see. All in all, if you like the first Galaxy game, you're gonna love this one. Fun fact, Mario Galaxy 2 is actually the first time a 3D Mario game and its predecessor are on the same console, and that shows. The gravity effects, sling stars, star bits, loomers are all returning factors, but that doesn't take anything away from this game being a pretty much perfect sequel. This game is very similar to the Mario Galaxy situation. A sequel that does a lot of the same as the original, but where Mario Galaxy 2 is almost identical to Mario Galaxy 1, Mario Maker 2 adds tons of new features that makes this game stand much more apart from its predecessor. The most requested feature that was missing from the first one was slopes, and this game adds two different variants, gentle and steep slopes. It also adds new enemies like the Angry Sun, Bansai Bill, and Boom Boom. There's also some completely new features like the on and off switches, and you can also make the angry sun into a moon, which has some really weird effects on the levels. Menus have also been reworked for the sequel, since many will play this game in docked mode. Now everything has been nicely organized, making it easier to find things you need to make the perfect level. In Mario Maker on the Wii U, there were four different styles you could make Mario levels in, and all these four styles are returning. Super Mario Bros, Super Mario Bros 3, Super Mario World, and New Super Mario Bros U. This time, however, there's a new style, Super Mario 3D World. This theme is packed with new stuff, like clear pipes, the cat bell, and even a car. This theme, however, is not compatible with the other features, where normally you can swap freely between them. But if you swap to the 3D World theme, you have to reset the level. The reason for this is just because there's too many different features. Like when you run, it's equivalent to the way you run in 3D World, and a bunch of the items are also exclusive to that game style and wouldn't really work in the other styles, at least that's what Nintendo says. In the different styles, you also have to choose what theme you want to make it in, and aside from the six returning ones, we have four new ones. Desert, Snowy, Forest, and Sky, which just adds to more variety, which 
you know, that's nice. <laughs> also, this game, unlike its predecessor, has a story mode, where you're trying to rebuild Peach's castle, and to do that you have to play through over a hundred developer levels that each showcase some unique mechanics you can find in the game. This is an excellent addition over the almost non-existent story mode in the first one. If you've dreamt of making your own Mario levels or just like to play through hundreds and thousands of them, there's no better way to do it than in Super Mario Maker 2. Mario has gone to many places during his lifetime. Grasslands, snowy peaks, and inside volcanoes. But in 2007, it was the little plumber's turn to go to a place he had never been before. This place was space. The story is as simple as ever. Bowser kidnaps Peach, but this time he doesn't just kidnap Peach, he kidnaps the entire castle and flies it into the center of the universe. The tone also is much more dark and serious compared to the other 3D Mario games, Mario Sunshine and Mario 64, and this tone persists during the entire game. You then get introduced for the first time ever to Rosalina, a now very iconic side character, and the Lumas. You learn that Bowser have stolen all the power, also called Power Stars, from Rosalina's ship called the Observatory, and the only way to reach Peach in the middle of the universe is with the Observatory. So you decide to help Rosalina and get all the Power Stars so you could get to Bowser and give him a good old beating. The Observatory also works as a hop world, similar to Peach's castle and Delfino Plaza. There's these small huts you go into, and from there you can fly out to all the different galaxies this game has to offer. And there is a lot of these, let me tell you. Gusty Gardens, a garden galaxy where you chase rabbits and fly with flowers. Honey Hive, where you become a bee and crawl on a... bee. And the loop to doob galaxy, where you race around on a manta named Ray. Yeah, there's a lot of different and weird stuff in this game, and that is what makes Super Mario Galaxy such a fantastic experience. Because of the new setting, the developers could get insanely creative with their level design. Mario could go to the left, to the right, he could walk on the ceiling and fall into black holes and get crushed into nothing. Like I said, this game can get pretty dark. Oh, a big new thing is the Star Pointer. You pointed your Wii Remote to grab star bits, shoot at enemies, and interact with the environment. And this was on the Wii, so to do a spin attack you had to shake your Wii Remote. Moving on, this was the first time a full orchestra played the soundtrack to a Mario game, and man does it just fit the setting. The violins, the flutes, every instrument just plays when it has to. The hop world, for example, I've talked about this before, but it's just fantastic how the theme just expands the more grand stars you get. Also, the sound effects are tremendous in this game, when you fall off the observatory. Or when you walk into a reading session with Rosalina. Everything just screams space, but without being too cliché. Super Mario Galaxy was a true innovation in Mario games, and to this day is still one of the most creative and original games of all time. It took Mario from incredible to even more incredible, and to think that all he needed was a little trip into space. So, Super Mario Bros. 3 had just been released, a game that really pushed the 8-bit NES to its limits. So, when it was announced that Nintendo were working on a 16-bit, more powerful console, people already started speculating about a new Mario game. And it turned out that Nintendo was in fact working on a successor to Super Mario Bros. 3. This game would of course come to known as Super Mario for World. Super Mario World borrowed a lot of stuff from Super Mario Bros. 3, but it incorporated a lot of new features on top of that. For instance, the world map is vastly different, and much less linear experience. The game doesn't take place in the Mushroom Kingdom either. Dinosaur Land was the name, and with a new land came new enemies. Some of these are staples in the Mario franchise to this day today. Wiggler, Charging Chuck, and Monty Mole. Now, this was called Dinosaur Land, so we of course also had some dinosaur enemies. One of these was Rex, who took two stumps to defeat. Normal enemies also got a rehaul, like the Koopa Trooper. Instead of being one of these slow turtles, they now walk up straight, and you can jump on them to push them out of your shell. Ooh. 
There is also new power-ups. Where Mario Bros. 3 had the raccoon suit, Mario World has the cape. It functions very similarly, but you have more control. And if you wiggle your stick enough, you can even make Mario do this, which extends your time in the air, and also just looks hilarious. The biggest feature, however, was the inclusion of Mario's ever iconic trusty pal, the green dinosaur, Yoshi. Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario, had ever since the first game wanted Mario to ride a dinosaur, but because of the supposed NES's limitations, they could just not make this feature work. Luckily, the new SNES's extra power made it so that Miyamoto could finally see his idea come to life. And boy, what an idea it was. Yoshi could eat enemies, some of which gave him the ability to spit fire or fly. He could help Mario jump even higher, get hard to reach items, or eat berries. He also worked as a free hit if Mario got hit while riding Yoshi. Koji Kondo is back, now better than ever, and with a more powerful console like the SNES meant that he had more audio tracks to work with, which meant that he could make more complex songs with a wider range of sounds and noises. New maps, new enemies, and a trusty new companion, this game had it all. It took what was great from its predecessor and just built upon it, just like any sequel should do. And here we are, numero uno. This game took everything that was great about previous Mario games and added some new features that made you think, how was this not in any Mario games before it? The game I'm talking about is obviously Super Mario Odyssey. Man, where do I even start? The new worlds, NPCs, or maybe with the biggest new feature of them all, Cappy. With Cappy, your enemies weren't so scary anymore. You could fly around like a bullet bill, make a Goomba tower, be a plant that can extend to massive heights, or a cheap cheap that doesn't have to go to the surface to get air. The possibilities were endless, and so must have the developers have thought, because there's just so many different enemies to capture. When I heard of this idea, it just seemed so obvious. It was there the entire time, yet it took us all by surprise when they announced it at the E3 of 2017. Such a simple feature that could completely change how we see and play Mario games. Mario's moveset is on point in this game. We have some new returning moves like the long jump, triple jump and ground pound, but now with Cappy we have tons of new moves we can do. Throwing Cappy up, down, round in a circle, or even jumping off of him. Mario can also roll, dive mid-air, and these were just a few examples. Mario also goes to a vast number of original and creative worlds. Cascade Kingdom, Luncheon Kingdom, and probably the most iconic of them all, New Donk City. These worlds are just bursting with personality and creativity, and all give you that Wow, feeling when you first see them. The stars are now in the past. Say hello to power moons, scattered all around these worlds, and you get them for all sorts of things. Mini games, challenges, and main missions. The game is also the most open world game we've ever had. Unlike Mario 64, Sunshine, and Galaxy, Odyssey doesn't spit you out of a level when you get a power moon, making for a much more immersive experience. Now, the biggest critique that this game gets is that there are just too many power moons scattered around these worlds, but I actually think that this is a great strength of the game, because let's say you only need 20 power moons in this kingdom, you can get them in multiple different ways, adding to some great replayability if you're aiming to play this game multiple times. A nice new feature is the way that lives and coins work, because lives don't exist in this game. Instead, you lose 10 coins when you die. Where before you collected 100 of these coins to get a new life, you now use the coins to buy new outfits for Mario and cool cosmetics for the Odyssey, which is Mario's transportation device. Now you buy these things in the crazy cap shops, which you can find located in every kingdom. In the shop, you can buy things with normal coins and... Purple coins? Purple coins are coins exclusive to each kingdom, and for these you can buy stuff that matches the theme in that kingdom. An example of this is the explorer outfit in the forest kingdom. This just adds another reason besides the power moon to explore every inch of every kingdom. This is simply Mario's biggest and best adventure yet. The graphics, controls, the world, and all the new ideas this game implements. An absolutely perfect game, and that is why it deserves to be at the number one spot on this list. And there you have it. 
Mario has been through a lot these last couple of decades, and it's really hard to rank these games because they are all just so incredibly good. I'm just excited to see where Mario goes next. Is it a new Odyssey, a new 2D Mario Bros game, or something completely different? Only time will tell. And that concludes this video. Do you agree with our list? I would love to see how your top 14 of the mainline Mario games would look down in the comments below. Stay safe, play some Mario games, Felix from Nintendo Life here, out. Oh.